Nope, we don't need to speed up the process. We don't need to nuke this. You know why? Because this is the non-microwave truth. I am C.L. Whiteside, and this is brought to you by Time of Grace Ministry. And when I was looking at my calendar, I noticed that it popped up Pride Month or LGBTQ plus month. And pretty much that's a month dedicated towards supporting people that are gay or non-binary or transgender or whatever and promoting how you can become an ally and support that group of individuals. And I just got to thinking, this is our first world problem question today. As Christians, if we get invited to a gay wedding, should we go? Should Christians attend a gay wedding? What do you think about that? Now, I actually asked about 10 different people this. All people that are, are Christians or would identify as Christians, I asked some pastors this question. And I felt like a lot of them took this as a, a tough question and they were kind of guarded. And I was like, don't worry, I'm not necessarily quoting you on this. I'm not going to name and say so-and-so said this. But, but I do want to hear, what do you think uh, about this? Now, I think all of the pastors that, that I asked this question said they would not attend. And one of them said, you know, it's actually a subjective question because nowhere in the Bible it is, does it say you shall not attend a gay wedding. But he said, we do have to look at the fact that the Bible and God does not agree with the homosexual lifestyle. He said, so I wouldn't go, but I would share with them why I did not attend. Another one said something of the nature of I wouldn't go, but I also wouldn't go to a wedding of two people that were cheating on each other. He said, sin is sin, and anybody who's proud in their sin, that's really something you don't want to show agreement to, with or, or support with. Someone else said, you know, I wouldn't go, but I would have to think about the fact, like, does this cause irreplaceable hurt? Um, is this person not going to be able to hear the gospel now? Am I their only outlet or only source of this? And he, he also brought up the point of, you know, I wouldn't go to a wedding if dude was marrying his fourth wife, like it was on some Mormon type stuff, we didn't know if that was legal or not. But if someone was marrying their fourth wife, he's like, I wouldn't go to that wedding either. Now, there were some people that said, you know what, I actually have been to a gay wedding because this was my best friend or this was a, a close family member. And they said I would go or I had I have gone and I would go again. So then I kind of asked him the question. I said, all right. I said, well, do you think that it, that. Um, a homosexual marriage is is a good thing in the eyes of the Lord. And they were like, no. I said, okay, would you go to a wedding where you knew two people were cheating on each other? And they were like, absolutely not. I would not go to that because it's wrong. I said, so kind of what, what's the difference? And the only thing that they could really come up with is that this was a, a close friend or it was a family member and they didn't want to have so much hurt that the person would never, ever talk to them again. Or they felt like this was going to miss out on the opportunity for them to witness to the person again or, or to bring the gospel to them. But my, my question kind of is like, are you really bringing the, the gospel to that person? Now, that's something I don't know. So that's where I can come off as a little judgmental in that way. But I, I understand that. I understand my biases with that. But something that I think that all of us have to realize is we are are willing to make exceptions if it hits close to home. Like if it's really a family member, if it's really somebody we're close to. And this passage from Galatians just reminds me of a thought process that we should have. It says this, Galatians 1 verse 10. It says, am I trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So I'm gonna just let you let you think. I'm gonna let that marinate on, on you a little bit. So, so what do you think? Do you think that they should, as Christians, we should go to a gay wedding? Now, something that I think we really, really have to just think about is like, what does our presence mean to them? And what does it mean to other other people there? If, if an unbeliever was there, would they assume or automatically think that I'm in support or that I'm in agreement with this, this lifestyle, with this wedding? And some definitely would. Some would even say, you know, I know some Christians who say, you know, homosexuality, homosexuality isn't even a sin. And I would be like, where does it say that in the Bible? Like, we got to go to the word. We got to go to the good book. Now, some people and I almost asked this question, but I didn't want to go and play the game of what would Jesus do? Would Jesus be there? And I know this is something that people point out at times and they say Jesus definitely would have been there because Jesus sat with the sinners. But I just want to remind people what Jesus did when it talked about and what was this? The misuse of Matthew chapter nine or Mark chapter two or Luke 
chapter 5, verse 29, when Jesus went to go eat with the sinners. I want to just point out something on what he was doing when he did go eat with the sinners. It says, Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why do you do that? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now, this is the key point right here. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but center, sinners to repentance. So Jesus' presence being there was to call people to repentance. So I just want to ask you this question. If you do say, yeah, I will go to this type of wedding. Are you there to call people to repentance? Or are you there to show support in a way that maybe you shouldn't be showing support? Now, I would love to hear from you. Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube. My handle is Champion Life 23. And this is our first world problem. As Christians, should Christians go to a gay wedding? And this is our first world problem. It is dinner time. The title of our episode today is Christ phobic and that means having an irrational fear or prejudice towards christ and christians christians we're going to talk a lot about that today in this episode now the whole goal of this episode the whole goal of this episode is for people who aren't um, completely so on christianity and i want to make sure that you don't become christ phobic and i just want you to hear a different perspective i want you to hear the non-microwave truth the non-microwave truth now there are a list of words or names or things that people do not want to be called. One of them would be racist. Another one would be like homophobic or, or transphobic. And another one would be sexist. Those are like three or four things that people do not want to be called at all today. And they go out of their way to make sure that they're not deemed racist or homophobic or, or sexist. They go out their way to make sure in a lot of cases. But it's just something that, I, that I'm realizing is that new Christians, not even new Christians, Christians are starting to get bullied into thinking that they're bullies when they're necessarily not bullies. They just don't agree. And what made me think about this is I was talking to a student. We were exercise. It was on the exercise bike. She was next to me. She was talking about our school. Our school is a Christian school that wants to give the truth, wants to give biblically sound doctrine. And she was just talking about sometimes, you know, it can be overwhelming because teachers, they sometimes don't care if a student might be struggling with the fact that they're that they're gay or if they're homosexual, because they always bring up the fact that it's wrong. And they always bring up the fact of what it says in the Bible, but they don't ever consider this student's feelings. And I said, OK, I said, are they pointing or singling the student out? They were like, well, she's like, well, no, not necessarily, but they just they bring it up. I said, well. If they bring it up, there might be some things that they hear where they need to give the truth and not just let it slide by, because that's what people that love you do. That's what people should do in, in a lot of cases if they don't necessarily agree. And it's something that, that's not true. And then she said, but, you know, they just can't help the, that the way that they feel. And I said, all right, but what does God say about the way that that we feel? He says, does he say to act on all of our feelings? And she was like, well, not necessarily, but some pe some people just can't help the way they feel. I said, okay. I said, well, let me give you this example. If I felt like cheating on my wife because I thought that was going to make me happy, would that be okay? She's like, absolutely not. You bet not. And I'm like, girl, I'm not thinking, not even thinking about that. I'm just giving you an example. Or what if someone felt that it was cool to mess with a person this age? She was like, oh, that's nasty. That's that. Uh -uh. I said, so how do we draw the line? I said, the only way we can draw the line is by looking at God's word and looking at an absolute truth, not your truth. And when people are, are telling you this truth, they're not telling you that to, to hate you or to make you feel bad. They're doing that because they have to give you the, the honest feedback that you need. And they shouldn't just tell you whatever you want to hear. And sometimes Christians are getting bullied into thinking when they give the truth that they are homophobic or, or transphobic, when in, in reality, they're just giving God's truth. And, and something we got to realize, just because someone took offense doesn't mean you gave offense. I'm going to say that again. Just because someone took offense doesn't mean that offense was actually given. Now, this is something that makes people become Christ phobic. 
And the Bible warns us on this. This is something that makes people become Christ. It comes from 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. This is the NLV version. It says, the time will come when people will not listen to the truth. They will look for teachers who tell them only what they want to hear. Only what they want to hear. The, the Bible warns us on this. The good book warns us on this. Now, if you look at some pastors, if you look at some podcasts, you look at some influencers or some people who, who give messages, they never want to touch on topics like this because they don't want to lose followers. They don't want to lose fans. They don't want to lose money. They don't want to lose pop popularity. They don't want to get canceled. They don't want somebody throwing stones at them or talking about the things that they do wrong. So they avoid these topics at all costs. And sometimes they hide behind, well, I just want to love people and I just want to show them the compassion. And it's just like, Showing people love and compassion is speaking the truth to them. And going back to that first world problem question, there was a dilemma. There was a dilemma. And the dilemma is like this. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? And what a lot of them, they would say, you know, what comes first? Me showing love and compassion or me speaking the truth when I know this person is going to take offense to it, when I know this person is not going to agree with me. Which one comes first? Do you just give love and compassion and love and compassion only or do you only give the truth when you know it's going to upset somebody? And in a lot of cases, especially when you have a relationship with someone, both, both need to come. Both have to come. They have to. They absolutely have to. Now, I did think it was a little arrogant for some of them to say, you know, I need to keep this relationship going because I'm going to be the only person that can give them the seed of the good news and the gospel. And a lot of times I'm like, well, are you really giving them the, the gospel? And they like, well, I don't want the relationship to get beyond repair. And it's like, but if you're not speaking the truth to them at all, you're not giving them the gospel anyways. You're not giving them the good news. You're not giving them the truth that they need to hear. And I do think that's arrogant to think that God won't be able to work through that because I've heard some people give the truth and they did cut that person off. They did not have another conversation with them, but it opened avenues and doors for other people. Just imagine if everybody was speaking the truth. Just imagine if everybody was speaking the truth and more so worried about giving the truth than worried about hurting somebody's feelings or having somebody be mad or, or cancel or, or cut me off. Now, it was interesting with the, that first world problem question I asked. Some of them did not want to exclude um, close friends. They didn't want to exclude family members because they did not want to part ways with them. But sometimes I pry and I get into it People will cut their family members off for being racist. They will cut them off for being janky. They will cut them off for being a pedophile. They will cut them off for things they don't agree with, but they don't necessarily want to cut them off with, with something like this. And that's something where I'm like, I, I don't get it. Cause they're like, they're just so toxic. They're so toxic. I had to cut them off. It's like, but you are worried about getting cut off or something not going right with this. You never know how the Lord can work. You, you never know how the Lord can work. So my advice for you, this is coming from, from God's word. If you are looking for a church, if you're looking for a pastor, if you're looking for a, a message, if you're looking to get the most out of something, the number one thing you should be looking for is truth. Are they speaking the truth, not like your truth, but the absolute truth and not something that's just all about making you comfortable. A lot of us go places and, and want to hear messages that just make us feel good and make us feel comfortable. And I'm not talking about like a, a cultural truth, but I'm talking about like an, an absolute truth, an absolute truth. Now, just looking at this is, is homosexuality, transgender, is that stuff even wrong? Well, I'm just going to give you some passages. You can go read these on your own, but I'm just going to give you the passages. It'll be at the bottom of the, the, the breakdown of this episode. All right. Mark chapter 10, verse 6 through 9. That's one. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2. Leviticus 18, verse 22. Leviticus 20, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And I'm going to read one to you. Romans 1, verse 26 to 28. So those passages will either tell you homosexuality is, is flat out wrong or it will show you, show you and tell you that a marriage is between one man and one woman. But this is the passage from, from Romans. 
It says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So it tells us that this is wrong and they got a penalty for it. There was a consequence for it. Now, why is it or why should people feel offense when called out? Like, why do people feel offense when they're called out on something like this? You know why? Because they're wrong. Because they're wrong. Galatians 5 verse 17 tells us this. It says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. So there should be some type of conflict. There should be some type of offense because it's not supposed to be like that. So when you speak the truth with people and there happens to be a conflict, don't don't worry. It's not about you. It's not they're not really mad at you. I mean, they aren't mad at you, but it's really they're mad at the spirit and the truth that you that you're giving them because these two can't coexist. They're, they're supposed to be checking each other. And that flesh, when that flesh is off, the spirit is supposed to check it. And the truth is supposed to do that. So it's not all about comfortable and feeling all mushy and good inside. That's not what it's about. Now, these are things that people hear that make them want to get on Christians, though, and makes them uh, Christ phobic. These are some things that people hear and make them want to get on Christians. It's like, why do they why do Christians have to harp on homosexuality or transgender? But you know what? Not all all actually do. And just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean that they're harping on it or making it seem like it's the the worst and the only sin that is ever talked about. But sometimes people try to throw that in your face, in the face of Christians, I should say. Um, Sometimes people don't want to hear from Christians on this because they look at it and they say, you know, a sin is a sin. And, and someone gave me an example like, you know, well, if People have sex before marriage. That's still a sin, but they get married. I'm like, yes, that is true. And both of these are sins. That That is a sin to do that before you get married. I said, but the difference is once you get married, you're no longer living in, in sin. The difference with things like homosexuality and transgender, especially when you get married, is that you aren't getting rid of that sin. You are taking pride in that sin. You are wrapping your entire identity in that sin. That that's a huge thing. And like, I feel like it's one of the only sins. And I think this is why people can get that, that Christ phobic people feel like they have to justify. It's one of the only sins where people have to over explain and bring up another sin. Like, you know, I'm not home. I'm not homophobic. I think it's wrong to steal. I think it's wrong to, to drink. But it's like, if we brought up the sin of, of stealing, you would never say, Hey, I think it's wrong to steal. And I, and I think it's wrong to murder. People would already like, okay, I get it. But since we've been pressured to think that and been pressured to over explain and over um, analyze that, we always got to try to bring up another another sin to be like, you know, I'm not homophobic or transphobic in that way. And that's why some people become Christphobic. And some people might be thinking to themselves, like, you know, what's the big deal about living in this sin or wrapping your identity in this sin? I mean, I guess this could be any type of sin. But with this especially is the identity gets wrapped up in this sin. And what happens is you start trying to serve two masters. You can't do it. You're either going to be devoted to one and hate the other. or You're going to be loving one and despise the other. Like you can't serve two masters. And these are two contradicting things. They're contradicting because God tells us through his word. That's not it. But what some people do is they warp this and they allow the enemy to separate them and, and change their relationship. And they say, like, I'm still worshiping God. I'm still worshiping Jesus. But it's like you, you're not. You have created an idol. You have created a new God that does whatever, uh, allows you to do whatever you want to do. But that's not the God that's described in, in the Bible. And that's a slippery slope, a huge slope of, of, of leading you to the eternal fire that you do not want to go down. So that's the purpose. That's the importance of, of speaking the truth to people. And that's why we can't just deliberately be sinning and wrapping our identity up in that and our sexuality or anything besides wrapping our identity in Christ. Now, there's a deceptive philosophy with this, too, a huge deceptive philosophy, which is talked about in Colossians 2, verse 8. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. And that's kind of the state that we're in now. 
the tradition, what, what culture tells us that you love who you love and it doesn't matter who you love. But when you look at God's word, it clearly tells us who to love, how to love. It breaks that down. It's very detailed. It's very to the point. It's very consistent in that message. Now, something that we got to just think about in this episode of Christ phobic. Every time someone disagrees or every time someone tells you that it's wrong, what if you actually thought it was out of love? What if you actually thought it was out of love? That would make the world world a difference. And I know sometimes for Christians, they're like, you know, I shouldn't judge. It's, it's not my place to judge. If they want to go do that, if Harry and Steve want to get together, that's on them. But it actually gives us a duty. It's actually a Christian's duty to, to tell this. Ephesians 5 verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Ephesians 4 verse 25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. James 5 verse 19 through 20, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins, cover over a multitude of sins. So those are just a few passages telling us like, man, we got to speak the truth. Part of loving someone is to, is to speak the truth. Now, just thinking about this, how ticked would you be if you went to the doctor and the doctor was like, you know what? I don't really want to tell them what's wrong because I don't want to make them feel bad. Or you know what? Ah, I guess they can slide with this. When the doctor, like if you don't tell them the person's going to die, that's kind of the position we are in as Christians. And uh, so many of us would be ticked if the doctor didn't say anything or the doctor was like, yeah, it's really, really good. Or the doctor, we told the doctor, yeah, I'm living a lifestyle where I do this, this and this. And the doctor supported you and said, yeah, that is awesome. And then you ended up having some major consequences or you end up breaking your leg. You'd be like, why didn't the doctor tell me this? Well, we're kind of in the same position as Christians. And this is one of the main sins where people act like they're not sick. This is one of the main sins that people act like they're not sick. If someone was um, cheating on a spouse, people would be like, that person's sick. If a person had a huge temper and was going out of their way and, and doing stuff, people would be like, that person is sick. But with homosexuality, this is something where people don't want to act like it's a sin where, where they are sick and, and they need a doctor. People are Christ phobic because they don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about hell. They don't want to hear I'm wrong. They don't want to hear that there's an absolute truth. But there actually is. It actually is. All, all these things are, are, are true. And the first thing we got to just look at with this homosexuality, transgender, is wrong. It's a sin. The second thing we got to look at is the world wants us to fear. But what's worse than being called a homophobic or a transphobic? It is being Christphobic. Galatians 6 verse 8 tells us those who live only to satisfy their sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. So what's worse than being called homophobic or transphobic is when you are, are dying and your harvest is decay and you get major consequences, maybe not in this world, but in the next world. So that's definitely worse. So that's the reason why we, we speak the truth out of love. And just a, a huge point that I want to bring up on this episode of Christ phobic, man. A lot of Christians, uh, of course, there there's always a bad apple in, in the bunch. But most Christians do not hate gay people or transgender people. They don't hate them. Another thing I to bring up. Christ didn't say, I'm going to die for all the sins except the sins of same sex attraction or of um, homosexuals or uh, of transgender. Christ didn't say, I'm going to die for all them sins except then. He didn't say that. He died for all sins. He paid a debt for all of those sins. Now, what we got to realize, it is wrong, but he paid for all sins. Now, this passage from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 and 26. It encourages us to speak the truth. It says this. It says opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. 
and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So it talks about that's that's a trap of the devil. You need to escape for that. You got to come to your senses. It only comes through, through speaking the truth. And the only way to be made acceptable to God, the only way to be made acceptable to God is not to be like, I'm going to live my truth and I'm going to do what makes me happy. The only way to be made acceptable to God is by the gift of faith, which is given given to us. So don't reject what Christ has done for you. Be his disciple. Be his disciple. Now, listen to what he says about being his disciple. This is from Mark chapter eight, verse 34 to 35. And we're going to use this to, to wrap everything up. It says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. In Matthew chapter 16, instead of instead of saving, it says you will find your life. And I know that so many people in the LGBTQ plus community are trying to find themselves. They are trying to find their life. But the only way you can truly find your life is through Christ and knowing what he has done for you and picking up the cross that he wants you to pick up. And this is the non-microwave truth. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Christ Phobic. Peace punch, Captain Crunch. Say no to drugs and yes to Jesus. I am out.